Vijay sir, you are on mute. You have to unmute and speak so that we get to. Yeah. Okay. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. So I can hear you, but uh, it's very weak. Okay. So it might be the case that uh, we both have our speakers on at the same time. So that might be causing this. But again, you are very clearly audible to me. So I assume uh, you are audible to everyone. So as and when you feel like, like whenever I'll be asking question, if that is not clear to you, you can ask me again. I'll try to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, sure. Okay. So we'll wait for a minute or so. Let people settle down and we start at eight and uh, we'll for our audience also like uh, this session is purely educational and uh, as and when you have any questions related uh, to investing framework or maybe except stock specific question we'll be happy to take uh, your questions to Vijay and we'll try to answer the questions best in our capacity. So meanwhile, guys, uh, let me utilize the time to introduce our guest for today. So today we have with us uh, Vijay Anand Venkata Raman, sir. He's a CFA and has over 20 plus experience of uh, investing in global markets. And he's founder of uh, Wealth Yentra Technologies Private Limited, a SEBI registered investment advisor. Till 2012, he was uh, based out of Hong Kong. He was managing multi-asset portfolios for uh, global investment firms, basically the hedge funds. And as far as his expertise is concerned, uh, it span across various asset classes that include equities, convertible bonds, and high yield credit. So in addition to managing his own portfolio, he also assisted the CIO in hedging the global micro and tail risk of uh, fund investment using derivative structures. And in his early part of his professional career, so Vijay was also part of the teams that used to advise the government of India on various uh, policy implementation matters. Uh, the hot sector, you can say energy, mining and financial sector, uh, financial services sector. He's also a co-chair of uh, Professional Learning CFA Society India and is a member of Alumni Schools Committee at University of Chicago. By education, he's an MBA. He did his MBA from BIM Trichy and his graduation is in, I mean, he's a graduate of Financial Mathematics Quantitative Finance from University of Chicago. That's, that's a great uh, uh, thing and uh, a very warm welcome sir and if i missed anything on your introduction i would uh, request you to surface that and in the opening note i would request you to like uh, tell us like where your journey in the investing or equity market started over to you sir you hear me yes yes i can yeah so thank you thank you friends for having me here it's uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, podcast uh, I mean, uh, Twitter Spaces is the first time I'm doing a doing one, and uh, very happy to be here. And uh, in the, I mean, illustrious list of your panelists that you have had, uh, so to, uh, happy to join that list. So where I started, see, my career is not the typical, you know, equity investor or investment manager or advisor career. So I started with banking, banking as in uh, project finance and things like that. So, so I started working for IDBI in 2000. A very pretty you know, not the greatest of the time to start working so and then uh, uh, so it was essentially into uh, energy and uh, you know related sectors infrastructure uh, largely and then uh, I had this opportunity where I kind of worked with uh, worked on projects where we were advising government of India on uh, various things so disinvestment looking at you know the the power policy um, uh, like, like for example, the the merchant power policy, or even even something like power exchange and things like that. So, which were not there, and uh, so worked on some very interesting projects. Uh, the first LNG terminal in India, the first SCZ in a, in a in a in a different very different ways. So uh, and so so again, after that, I spent a year with uh, Asset Reconstruction Company, which was. Uh, 
essentially created in 2000 arsil 2004 uh, to clear to kind of 2003 to kind of you know look at npls uh, in india and uh, spent a year in with uh, instanang india advising or advising companies on uh, uh, on mnd and things like that so uh, there's a short period uh, with eny less than a year or almost a year less than a year i think if the screen logs it it logs me off yeah can you where, yes, where did you lose me yeah few seconds 4 5 second not more than that okay so essentially if the screen logs it just goes yeah okay so so yeah so spent a year with eny uh, advising uh, largely uh, tata group and on various initiatives that they had i mean worked with them on some very interesting startup ideas and things like that and then took a sabbatical went to us and post us i i moved to hong kong hong kong was a very interesting thing in the sense it was a hedge fund um uh so 2000 mid middle of 2006 right after the the the, the market fall of 2006 in may so i started working for them uh, till the uh, end of the financial crisis and then uh, then started working with another hedge fund in hong kong again uh, spent about uh, Two, three years, so total six years with Hong Kong, two different hedge funds, and then came back to India. So it was not really exactly the typical equity analyst, uh, analyst or an equity career that I had. So uh, in essence, like I, I have spent time in uh, credit, I have spent time in uh, uh, distressed debt, I have spent time in uh, other asset classes as well. So at Hong Kong uh, with the hedge funds, it was predominantly, you know, predominantly investing in non-Chinese market. So it's not. Uh, so uh, although largely my uh, my books were uh, focused on india so i also had a mandate to invest in say australia uh, japan a uh, bits and pieces in japan and and everywhere else no china and uh, uh, no korea and no taiwan so largely the english speaking markets in asia and where case if, if you look at some of these markets in you know china or taiwan even the annual report used to be in chinese it's very difficult to read even the numbers so largely the english speaking markets and where uh, where english law was the dom- was, was the basis of uh, legislation and things like that right so uh, so it was an interesting journey which started in uh, credit uh, advisory and then moved into a multi asset uh, large liquid markets uh, so in terms of strategies it was equity long shot primarily uh, long shot as in uh, and then uh, they look for an idea which has a catalyst basically on either side of the either direction whether it's a long catalyst or the short catalyst so in addition to that i also was running one of the a reasonable sized convertible bond uh, uh, book uh, foc- that was focused entirely on india if you remember 2005 6 7 8 that period india was one of the largest uh, convertible bond markets uh, in the world so we had the largest issuances and so i was managing a, a convert book and then uh, so strategies markets were like you know they kind of look at different strategies in different markets so for example when i looked at australia I was largely uh, what we call as merger arbitrage merger arbitrage as in look for transactions where look for uh, investments where there is a potential takeover either pre trans pre takeover or during the takeover uh, during the transaction and then uh, india was largely equity long shot uh, and uh, convertible bond the rest of the markets were like everything else so like japan was a, was a, was was a quantitative book quantitative book as in like completely into i don't even know what the company does for a does for a, this thing it was essentially based on statistical data data sets so it was a mix uh, in terms of uh, strategies and things like that but the journey was very different it's not, like i said i i didn't have a typical uh, a uh, typical equity investor journey where you start you start in the buy side or sell side as an analyst then become a lead analyst for a sector and then kind of look at a become a portfolio manager uh, or a smaller fund and then grow into a large fund and things like that so mine has always it, it it was quite opportunistic in the sense like wherever there is an opportunity uh, to put money to work within these parameters so you you go in you go in as an you invest your money there so that's uh, that's been my journey uh, in uh, in uh, formal uh, employment and then well 2012 i we came i came back to india the intention was to set up a category 3 alternative fund which uh, 
uh, I mean to deploy the kind of strategies I was running back and back for the hedge funds. And that's still like it's been 12 years and it's uh, I'm still trying to figure out if I want to do that. So that's that's broadly my journey. Great, uh, Vijay. So Vijay, uh, I mean, uh, specifically, if I were to ask you about in your investing style, so how you would define it and uh, say, for example, in current market scenario, how you would be placing yourself in finding the opportunities? So, see, I don't you know, I don't subscribe to any specific uh, style. See, essentially in the sense that, you know, whether it's whether I'm a value investor or a growth investor or any of that. See, like I said, it's very, very uh, kind of opportunistic. Opportunistic as in, if I find value, because see, my mandate was different, right? So I didn't, I don't need to stay invested always. So I could remain un uninvested in the sense I can be uh, invested fully. I can take a short view. I could take, so I could take a, a, a balanced view or any of, I could, I can be between 100% long to so significant uh, shots. So, so I was never, uh, even now I'm not very, uh, I don't have any specific style or something. I'm quite style ag agnostic. So if I find value to be attractive, so I would look at, you know, some of those, uh, uh, val as in like, see, I don't define value the traditional way one would define. If I find it, it's, it's very opportunistic. So if I find something very interesting and I anticipate, you know, this particular uh, uh, investment could generate certain uh, certain returns to me in a certain time period, I'm there. But typically the time period, uh, so over a period of time, this time period has only increased. So initially when I was uh, looking at it, it used to be like 12 months plus, and then it, it's now I'm looking at something where I'm uh, looking at three to four years at least. So what has happened is, so it's not very, uh, would I look at value, would I look at Growth knows there is an opportunity to make certain returns in a, in a three to four five year period. I I'll be placing my uh, uh, it would be in part of my portfolio. And I run a very so even yeah, so uh, so back in those days also it was a very concentrated portfolio. See, uh, we had a global fund, right? The first fund that I was part of was a global fund. So I was managing a portion, very small portion of a global fund. Then. In the second uh, second uh, thing, second phase in Hong Kong, it was an Asia fund. So again, being an Asia fund, I was managing a certain larger portion of Asia fund, not larger as in not the biggest, but much bigger than, in percentage term, bigger than what it was in the previous firm. So essentially, uh, there was no reason for me to stay invested always. I can stay invested, have a long, long view on, on a particular uh, country or whatever. I can also take a short view on the country. Right. I can take a short view. And uh, so that being the case, I've always been very opportunistic. It is, it is I'm not confined. I won't confine. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I mean, advantage and the disadvantage in the sense, A, it's very difficult to explain and B, uh, and, you know, as an disadvantage and B, as advantage, if you look at it, I don't need to con con contain myself to a certain, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, belief systems. So if there is an opportunity, if I can scale that opportunity to the fund, so yeah, take that, uh, take that trade in. So we have few, few examples to your mind wherein you define like what kind of opportunity you look for, maybe any past examples or if you're comfortable any any recent examples, whichever way you want to. Yeah, so it's like, so let me, so for example, recently, right, when I say recently, uh, let's say something in 2016, 17, right? So, uh, I, so one thing, one thing I'm clear is I'm always, uh, I understand, I try to understand the cycles, right? And where, uh, and, uh, and, and I look for opportunities based on where we are in the cycle. Now, for example, 2016, 17, 16, 17, I started looking at, you know, telecom. Now, telecom was like, you know, there is huge, uh, there was like a lot of things happening there, right? In the sense, uh, uh, Geo was getting uh, getting to action and things. Like that. So didn't do anything for almost two years. So waited, just waited, watched. So do my, uh, so there is, for somebody who has been investing, you have been tracking companies for, for years, there's not much of deep research one needs to do. So you know broadly the factors that drive EPS. 
you know the factors that drive valuations you know the factors so broadly your models are set so you have models as in like your thinking processes are set uh, on a sectoral basis right so you don't i don't so essentially when i was looking at it telecom was kind of uh, was attractive it was getting interesting not attractive and then 2017 jio uh, uh, announced uh, their uh, uh, Geo announced their uh, commercial launch in terms of pricing and all that. It was better than anticipated, right? So that's that's the thing. So you had a positive surprise. So so when in my investment, so whenever I look for, I look for some kind of a positive surprise, which is is uh, not anticipated. And then so Geo was a uh, so, so Reliance was a great bet to me, right? So so and then a year later, you realize that, that there is not going to be a price war. So I slowly added uh, uh, Bharti to my to my thesis so so then what happened was reliance did the rights and then uh, over a period of time so yeah so from bharti so after bharti did their rights issue so and then like there was partly paid partly paid was see uh, people who have read uh, uh, darwas his book on he talks about how partly paid shares uh, gives you a very good leverage leverage on the uh, on the company in the sense that because Practically speaking, the unpaid uh, unpaid amount is a is a, is you are you are borrowing that money from the company. Whenever the company wants, you are going to pay it, right? In a way, so you get a leverage position. So the company allows you certain leverage to uh, invest in itself. So to me, at that point, Bharti was super attractive. So partly paid was much more attractive. So I got into partly paid. So if you see that trade uh, started with one, got into another, and in the mean and in the in, in the one thing I forgot was in the meanwhile when uh, when what do you call that uh, uh, idea was uh, kind of trying to do certain things and it was uh, single digit numbers it was also a good trade so it's not a great great it's not a great investment so i traded in and out so i have a thesis that telecom is a great sector so it was a great sector at that point in time slowly play your thesis through it and then when there is an opportunity to trade you trade and some obviously the trade didn't make uh, make much money because when you size it, you always size your uh, uh, your core positions bigger than your trading positions. Right. So so that's one example of, you know, looking. So 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 typically I look at sectors which is like not in favor and, and I completely ignore sectors. See, one thing I will realize is so so 2008 was a positive. Year. I had a positive year in 2008. Right. So very few of us were I mean, I was probably lucky to have a, have a positive year in 2008. But one thing uh, clear was end of uh, end of '07, we uh, the, the firm we, we just sold out uh, the entire uh, India book. Right, end of 2007, like valuations were uh, very expensive, so we sold out and uh, we uh, we kind of built some interesting short positions uh, outside India, so which kind of helped us to navigate. Uh, 08 and the first six months and then the the, the, the firm unwound end of 08 the first six months uh, when we were there uh, uh, despite the market fall and all that we had a we had a very small positive return so the v here is just me it's not like you know just the firm i'm referring to as v it's not that we i was running a team or anything it's just me so essentially uh so a lot of times when when uh, things are so so i so i see like uh if there is an opportunity so don't i don't confine myself to any of these but try to be uh, try to be a contrarian and try to look for something which is non consensus so if everybody is short i am not going to make money if every when everybody is in the trade i am not going to make alpha i am not going to even generate returns right so so that's how uh, I, uh, that's that's one example and, and when i look for look look back and think about uh, most of my investment ideas a, there are two things which would have happened. A, fundamentally, there are there would be some catalyst which I'm, which I'm, uh, there is a hypothesis on a, on a certain catalyst, and uh, when you really make money when that catalyst turns out, turns out, and you are right on that catalyst, and invariably, uh, what I find is uh, when you do that, it's uh, uh, a, you are you are you are slightly ahead of uh, time, so which is which is fine. So you're not going to get that. You know, best of the time, I mean, you're not going to get the timing perfectly right every time. And uh, coming to where I see, I don't see much opportunities today, honestly. So, so in the sense that uh, today I find, uh, I mean, when I say I don't find opportunities, I don't find much opportunities in India today. So uh, we are uh, um, kind of, you know, uh, in in my mind, we are a bit overvalued, uh, and I see a lot of uh, 
a lot of things that i see behaviorally uh, behave as well as uh, in in uh, in some kind of you know matrices as well i am seeing we are more closer to ye we lost you so so where i see now is like you know i am seeing more like where we were in december 2007 or jan 2008 or even the december 17 uh, jan 18 so that's uh, that's how i read uh, markets today so like like you said all these are just examples from the past it's not uh, and, and i don't hold uh, at the moment uh, i don't have view on telecom i'm out of telecom uh, fully out of telecom so essentially it's like uh, so right now i'm just kind of you know building uh, like building for a uh, for the next cycle which is uh, which is probably some time away so right now i see situations i see a lot of uh, uh, data sets telling me that you know we are very similar to what we were in 2007 and 2017 so and interestingly i i somehow find you know uh, china to be china as attractive as well so so a lot of time you know you just stay away from the crowd stay away from the crowd in the sense not for the sake of it but uh, when there is uh, when when the when it is crowded you're not going to make much money it is already overvalued so so, so that's video, what it is and okay you, uh, that is uh, well taken that there are uh, not many opportunities and you were talking about uh, what's the general consensus is that hardly happens so broadly uh, if if you hear out across the industry uh, people say that large caps have not done well in last two or three years and uh, 2024 year would be uh, belonging to large yeah so i hear that i hear you see the thing is this right so when i say this uh, setup so so one of the things that we see is you know the, the performance of uh, small and mid caps right so it's been phenomenal over the last uh, uh three three and a half years and more so in the last six months and so when when i when you see that when it's it's not that money rotates to to large caps alone when when in the past what we have seen is uh, money uh, it's actually a uh, some kind of a correction before money rotates right it's not that because small so small caps are expensive think about it in in every bull market or any market it's the small caps which gets re-rated last because money starts coming into large caps first it doesn't come into large caps the last so money comes into large caps and then as you, as large caps get overvalued money moves into mid and then over to small and then when small caps get expensive it's it's like you know it's kind of we get to a point where it is uh, more closer to end of the market cycle rather than uh the new cycle see it it is true that you know large caps can do well large caps can give you uh can potentially give you uh, uh better returns than small caps but not necessarily i wouldn't be you know uh, while uh, while i i hear that argument that small large caps are have not done much and could do uh, well this year i would think to think of it as a i uh, mean it's it's uh, they could do better than small caps yes but that doesn't mean they could generate See, ultimately you know market should be valuable enough to give you the equity risk premium so when equity risk premium are not being delivered in the sense that you know you need certain excess return over a time so when that is uh, when the probability of that is low it, it doesn't make sense to stay invested so seeing the euphoria in the market and uh, the india story so do you think like uh, it is more on the narrative side and actually on ground the things are not so rosy or uh, contrary to which i mean seeing the run up which has happened in last 3 4 years and the liquidity position the market is kind of uh, frothy or the valuations have grown crazy i mean which which we we are heading when you are saying that uh, the the uh, i mean the condition or the outlook of the market appears to be just uh, like uh, if we draw a parallel to december 2007 or maybe 70 in that sense like then i mean is it fair to assume you are in total cash or uh, i mean how you are placing yourself so uh, two things right when we talk about 
so when you when you look at markets and when you look at you know it's about how much you want to participate so for example between 2020 and uh, 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 late 2021 or late, mid to late 2021 we were fully i was fully invested then since then i have been slowly reducing my increasing my cash position right but at the same time i wasn't at that point i wasn't selling my small caps i was holding to my so so the way i do that is see i am not a small cap stock picker right i am my ideas because they are big picture ideas so they'd work large they work well in large caps so i stick to my ideation to the top 100 150 companies i don't go beyond in fact i wouldn't even know most of the companies beyond the beyond that list 150 200 companies so what happens is so if i am liking uh, something like a small cap i go through funds period so leave the fund leave the stock selection to uh, small cap experts now what i'm finding today is between 22 20 and 2021 to mid, mid to late 2021 we were the entire market was attractive then what happened there was you know small cap continued to remain attractive whereas large caps were not attractive because if you see what happened in uh, you know mid to late uh, uh, somewhere around september or august september of 2021 that rally was driven by by it services and 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 uh, stocks which were supposedly uh, they were growth stocks and then that rally rotated in uh, can you check your connection please so it is not that the large caps have not done well it is the growth stocks have not done well over the last one and a half two years maybe maybe two and a half years even right yeah almost two and a half years so they have not that is what has not done well the value has done very value stocks have done very well and then uh, is there an opportunity to buy in growth today my thing is yes but see uh, again uh, i don't think this rotation into growth is going to be a smooth rotation because there has to be something which gets gives in here and then money goes into growth so somewhere there has to be this you know uh, that that correction in uh, value correction in values to correction in value as a theme correction in uh, in in uh, you know uh, where where uh, the narrative driven uh, star uh, rally but see it is not that nothing has happened on the ground see this is the interesting thing it's not like it is not that there are a lot of changes see honestly if you look at the last 3 years 3 4 years there been lot, there are a lot of changes because a lot of, and which is what is contributing to this uh, narrative right but the point here is uh, so some of those changes so for example the earnings numbers per se at the at the large cap at the large index level has been driven by return to profitability of corporate banks return to profit profitability of some of the large cyclical cyclical businesses so that has happened so that has contributed significantly so for a long period we had a very very low uh, low uh, anemic uh, kind of an eps growth uh, which was uh, uh, single digits low single digits for a long period and now it is there has been this one off effect so so if you see and that is kind of giving up that has given up in the last one year so the growth that is really you know that the last trailing 12 month growth if you track that data that is not coming up the way uh, way it was that's that's one so so it's like the one offs have played out uh, and then now we see a situation where uh, there is no uh, uh, there is uh, no momentum on the earnings so so when i look at momentum i look at earnings momentum so when i look at earnings i don't see much of momentum on the earnings and uh, so that's that's the other thing so it is not that the narrative is not correct the narrative is right so so st if you had seen some of my old articles or old uh, tweets i would have mentioned like you know this is going to be india's uh, much before so 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 uh, like you know mid 2020 uh, when we when i started looking at the, the way the reforms were built into the re recovery of uh, economic recovery as in like the way government came up with those schemes from may 2020 onward it was brilliant i mean like there was an opportunity that they didn't let pass it was just brilliant the way they you know came up with a scheme after scheme and then so the recovery was uh, uh, but but the thing is now this needs to start paying and i i think that that is where we will get surprised on the downside so in the sense that vijay been pump priming which has been great and private sector capex is not really uh, you know it's not really picked up the way government would have anticipated 
and there is little fiscal uh, uh, fiscal space to continue these uh, pump priming and we have seen that so one indication that came from the from the interim budget was that you know we will we are on the path of fiscal fiscal consolidation so there is no um, room for uh, um, you know surprises or whichever way you call that so so essentially a lot of things have changed and the narrative is also it's not an incorrect so it is so i my own belief is uh, this the next few few years and um, uh, belongs to us but markets have I, I have run way ahead of that so that's the, that's my concern when market has run way ahead of us then uh, it is time to uh, think uh, see how much you want to participate so i'm not fully i'm not fully in cash so i am invested but i'm not fully invested so i have cash and uh, i also have you know interestingly i also have on my i mean like uh, um i would also into the into the next 3 4 5 months i would also be adding to uh, protection on my portfolio so whatever cash i have whatever uh, long positions i have i would also have some kind of uh, hedges around it so it's it's time to build that either naked naked you know by by protection by options or put options or protect your uh, books or reduce increase to cash or do both right so we are coming to the banking and finance uh, sector what are your thoughts around uh, this sector i mean if if you uh, i mean so corporate with the... so see the thing is this right so this entire uh, entire thesis that we talk about is uh, it's a capex cycle the story is india capex india uh, capex in the sense uh, trying to create your supply chain so you need to set up your uh, you need to invest so essentially it's a capex story now which means private banks i mean like retail banks are not part of my play right retail banks are not part of my play so i would continue to invest money into corporate banks see the way i look at it is this in a correct see the way i look at it is see i don't need to move money from a to b straight away i can move money from a into cash wait in cash and then move to b right so when i am looking at it so there are so every correction i would use every correction to add to india domestic stories which is capex driven stories so so if there is a correction i would buy banks corporate banks if there is a correction thing with corporate banks see banking the way i model banks is i look at three factors one is what is the term spread b what is the credit spread and what is the credit cost so a plus b minus c now i have to take a view on a, on all of this right and uh, two out of three if i get right i'm 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 fine now the challenge today is there is no term spread in the rates so your one year's rate is 7% your 10 year rate is 7% so practically one lever for eps one lever for earnings of for banks is just not does not exist which is your term spread so that is why we have we call something like you know in in macro there is something called steepener Uh, whether the curve is steep whether the curve curve is we talk about curve inversion curve steepener flattener or something now the curve is kind of very flat short end and uh, and your long end they are they are almost at the same level in fact to the extent they know on the day of budget for a brief period it went negative also right so that lever is gone so now which means you are not making money by borrowing in the lower end which is what banks do right because if you see most of their borrowing is at the lower end and lending is at the higher end now that spread doesn't exist much and then you have the credit spread the credit spread is reasonably good uh, but again where uh, earnings are where earnings are today and where uh, the cycle is it, it doesn't make sense to take a credit so wait in balance is there is a correction i know i want that all right So Ravi, you have any questions on your part? Okay. So Alpesh, uh, you can ask your question. You can unmute and ask your question. Okay. Some some trouble on his end also. So so you talked about the uh, supply chain thing. So Vijay, like uh, on the export thing, how you are seeing the uh, global macros at this point in time? See, the thing is this, right? See, we so global. See, global macro is weak. 
so my basics so okay when i look at big picture it's like you know the way i look at it is global macro is weak one at the same time this whole rate cuts and all that i don't see much space for rate cuts it's not going to happen because you think about it so you had cheap labor from china supporting global growth correct in some form or the other now what has happened is when you are creating this whole supply chain realignment story you have to reinvest right you have to invest you have to take a hit in china in your investments in china and you have to put capacities elsewhere now these capacities are not a not going to come cheap b this capacity this this supply the new supply that's going to is, let's say from any country which could be it could be india it could be mexico it could be uh, you know thailand or it could be you know wherever whichever country you look at it it's not going to give you the same economics as china which means for a for a considerable period we are going to be in a rising you know your raw your uh, your product costs are going to keep rising slowly right slowly in the sense you cannot it's not that you know 100% of your uh, production in china is going to get replaced so over a period let's say 100 goes to 98 goes to 96 so it's going to be a multi year thing right slowly this this change is going to feed into feed into the end end prices so this whole inflation uh, dynamics that we talk about it's this it's going to remain there it's not going to go away right so that being the case i don't see any rate cut or any of those happening uh, very soon in the west now having said that we are see what are we when with china plus when we talk about china plus one we are not really talking about growth there we are talking about think of it like you know market growth versus market share for a company right so let's say a company uh, in a, in any specific industry can do a can target market growth or you can gain market share so this uh vijay lost you again maybe some network issue or some twitter glitch both is bad because the plus one countries are going to gain market share from china it is not something that going to affect them so to me the global macro in china plus one story does not matter much because it's not a you're not playing on growth but market share in 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 single statement so vijay like you you just said uh, that uh, if if uh, there is some correction in the market over a period of say 4 5 6 month you will deploy the cash you at uh, uh, cash at hand so i mean which which sectors you believe are beaten down or maybe ignored by the broader market uh, where uh, see, you uh, see unfortunately today right nothing is ignored see what has happened is our microstructure has significantly changed it's not earlier it was the flows were you know largely overseas flows today the flows are you know there is a very strong domestic flows which is coming in now will this uh, so so the interesting thing here is these flows are going to come come in irrespective of where the markets are this go, flows are going to keep uh, markets at certain valuation so for me unless i really see an opportunity i wouldn't deploy my money so and those deployment dep- see this again like i said the bigger picture it is a domestic india story right domestic india it is not consumption it is domestic capital deploy wherever there is an opportunity so so right now i don't see anything anything uh, which can deliver uh, returns you know significant returns that can give me that equity risk premium of you know 4 5 6% over uh, over a uh, period of rates so right now it's like you know so let's see that's the whole thing when you rotate that that i think when i rotate from a sector to b i don't rotate right away it is not i from a to d to buy b i am very very happy to remain till i find that b remain in cash and that cash could take some time to so it could take some months sometimes it's it's longer it's not it's quarter sometimes it's maybe a year maybe longer than a year so i'm very happy to stay see, see like like i said i slowly added cash for almost two and a half years close to in another three four months it will be like you know, three years So I have been adding cash to my portfolios, uh, but I retained uh, 
Retain the exposure to small caps, and which I reduced, which I'm completely out of small caps as well as of the 31st. So, I've, and see, these are things that also, if you see, I have, you know, if uh, uh, it's so, whenever I make this big acid allocation changes, I kind of tweet about it also. When I, particularly uh, on both sides, when I when I'm uh, finding things expensive, so I, I write about it. I use certain uh, metrics to define that, and those. Are, that is also on my Twitter timeline. If you if, if uh, people have the patience to see, it's like it's there. So that, I mean, like uh, so it's every, most of my decisions I write about it. So right now it's like you know it's very difficult to say. Yeah, I'm sexy. They say, for example, my my so markets are correct, but because the narratives are so strong, my the sectors I want to put money are correct. So I cannot reply. But again, like market may correct significantly, which may, which may give me an opportunity which could play out much longer, you know, and a much, you know, much farther away. So, it, anything, so just, just give, being in cash gives me that opportunity to choose what I want to do at, at a certain, you know, in a future time, time point. And see, actually, another thing is, you know, when we talk about all this, it's all about flows. It's like, you know, why market? See, if you talk to anybody today, the thing is, yeah, flows are there, right? Flows are there. Now, the point is, people are not even today talking about uh, fundamentals. So, so when you talk to people, it's like, you know, what do you do with the flow? So, the flows, essentially, there is demand for paper, demand for paper, but there is no supply. Now, think of a situation if this supply can be met. So, to me, the biggest risk to markets today is. What happens if this supply, if there is supply of paper? So then this whole SIP flow or whatever gets absorbed. So there is no further, say today a lot of these returns that we see is largely due to the flow effect. Valuations are, people have stopped seeing valuations long ago because people have moved from, see, interestingly, people used to talk about India, absolute terms are valuable. People today are talking about no small caps are not valuable, large caps are. Large caps are valuable. So, essentially, what has happened is in a very natural way, people are moved from absolute investing to relative investing. Because yeah. there is this whole flow dynamics has changed, the microstructure has changed. So, for yeah. me, I don't need to, you know, I don't see a reason as to. So, have cash if there is an opportunity, deploy. Fair point. So, Ravi and uh... Vineet, uh, one by one, you can go and uh, ask. Uh, hello. Hi, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. So, like, uh, uh, like you know, uh, we all agree that we keep, you know, listening this thing that Indian markets are uh, pretty overvalued or overbought. But at the same point, like, as you also pointed out, that at micro level, the overall the flows in the markets have changed. And the very nature of those flows is pretty sticky in nature. Like even if we go into a downturn right now, I don't think that the entire flow is gonna, you know, stop or evaporate over overnight. So in that scenario, can it be said that the you know optical overvaluation or high valuation of the Indian equity market is actually to a fair extent, not if not completely to a fair extent, part of the new normal? Because, like, you know, the overall participation, the overall depth and the width of the market in India has been pretty limited compared to its overall economy size as well as population size. So, like, I wanted your views on this. Okay, so let's, uh, so let's, uh, what has happened over the last two and a half years. Now, what we say is, uh, there is flow, yes. So, there is sticky flow. Now, so SAP flow was close to about five six thousand sometime uh, middle of own, middle of nineteen before COVID, and it is now almost sixteen eighteen thousand, right? Let's say six thousand back then and and, and twenty thousand now, right? But if you see the last period, last two and a half years, look at the months when markets gave you returns. See, markets are bad. See, what does market? Uh, uh, rewards markets reward surprises see if everybody thinks sip flow is going it's in the price already correct 
So if SIP flows are going to keep coming, that's in the price because people are already pricing in a 20,000 crore SIP book going to 30,000 crore over the next few years. So that's consensus. I'm not even disputing that. Now, when it is consensus, it's in the price. Is there somebody who says in the market that SIP flows are going to stop or SIP flows are going to go down? No. But we all agree that SIP flows are going to continue. What happened? Because that's a sticky money. It's a sticky investment. Sticky flows. But at the same time, you see the last 30 odd months, what has happened is the months that FIA has put in money, markets move. And the months that FIA has withdrawn money, market goes, market goes down. Now, the surprise factor for returns today is FIA flows. So, earlier, the surprise factor was always FIA. Now, it is back. FIAs are back in the play. Right? Because SAP is a consensus thing. And you you saw you only markets are generating huge returns. So look at look at what happened in October. Look in December, October. So December, January. If you really see what happened, FAA sold October, markets were down significantly. FA bought into December, markets were up significantly. FA sold in Jan, markets were down flat and flat and down. Now the point here is there is a there is this whole the joker in the back or or the entire you know uh, what, I, what I would call this uh, the surprise element is in FAA flows. SIP is part of it. In a case, if SIP goes down, then markets will tax significantly. But if the SIP goes from 20, 15,000, so from 17, 18,000 to uh, 25, 30,000 over a period of time, markets are going to reward that because that's already in the price. Hmm. Interesting, sir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I take your point. Interesting perspective, you know, to look at things. Yes. Vineet. Hello, Vijayji. Hope I am audible. Yeah, yeah, I, I can hear you. So, Vijayji, I have two questions. Uh, uh, one is on banking and other is on China plus one theme, which you mentioned. On banking, uh, you mentioned that uh, corporate driven uh, lending uh, is where you are looking at. Uh, what is your opinion on uh, high cost of deposits because of deposit paucity? And since corporate lending is a lower yielding uh, product, uh, the NIMs for the industry uh, would remain uh, under pressure for the time being. That's the first question. Uh, second question on the China plus one theme, uh, specifically on the chemicals, a lot of China dumping is happening uh, across the globe for a lot of chemicals. And hence, uh, the margins have completely uh, gone uh, eroded and uh, almost all players are reporting bad numbers. How long uh, will that dumping continue if you have any idea? And uh, since the destocking, etc., uh, will take some time, uh, where do you see China plus one theme uh, going to end up? OK, so first, let me answer the, the easier one. See, I have no idea on chemicals. So, so, so chemicals is not my circle of competence. See, so chemicals, how long this, you know, whatever China is doing or whatever is happening, I have no idea, right? So the way, way I'm playing this is if China plus one has to work for India, you have to create certain capacities, right? Whether it is in chemical, whether it is in semiconductor, whether it is in uh, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, you have to create capacities. Vijayji lost you again. So I yeah, so for chemicals per se, I have no view. But when I talk about China plus one, it can be in chemicals, it can be in semiconductor, it can be in ABC industry or XYZ industry, anything, right? But for you to participate, you need to create those capacities first. So the way I'm playing that theme is by cap by playing the capex side, the, the capex, the companies which are benefiting from the capex which essentially leads to the second point, which is why I am positive on the corporate bank. Because, see, we are going to create that capacity. When you create that capacity, A, the guy who is going to build that factory is going to make money. The fellow who is going to fund that factory is also going to make money. Now, see, I don't have a view on like where NIMS could be. Will it be like, I don't even know where the NIMS are today. See, that's the whole thing. See, I, I don't read balance sheets. I don't read annual reports. See, that's why I'm like, you know, when I spoke to 
friends i said like i don't know what to speak but the whole point is i don't read a lot of these things i don't i don't read those numbers in that kind of a detail but i know broadly that certain macro plays into these numbers in certain fashion and i understand that dynamics so if you ask me like whether the nims would be you know but the nims would compress primarily because irrespective of whatever it is your 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 curve is flat when curve is flat the nims will compress so that macro when i'm looking at short end versus the long end of the curve because uh, whatever it is uh, the short end versus uh, long end of the curve and the spread on that i know that you know there is no there is a there is a nim compression happening right no so i will wait out that's why i said i will buy now i will wait out to this number this data to play on the numbers now how long it will take i wait i'm like i am not uh, i am not in any hurry to put money to additional money to whichever wherever i cash out or cash down so chemicals first i don't have a view so but my view is very simple it's like okay, but again like i said like chemicals are largely uh, small cap play for so when i generate uh, small cap on attractive anything under that is an attractive thing. so i don't see it when i look at you know, when i look at the bigger picture and say that you know small caps are not attractive and small caps are likely to correct or may correct and i look back at historical data on that it's very likely that it's a very small probability or a very small uh, percentage of stocks which will uh, do well in such a scenario let's say there are 250 small caps or 500 small caps so you know the problem in, in a in a situation where the headline on small caps is not so great it's very rare that there will be like some stocks doing well so i don't bet against that i don't need to go and find that small cap which will do well or that mid cap which will do well no, i don't do that so and, and typically i look for the opportunity say so think about it so there are two this two ways people look at it one a small cap which has a limited free limited uh, uh, investable headroom can very quickly go you know can get over that the last cap will take time to time to uh, get into that over valuation zone now typically when that when both of them are there are, are over value and your chemicals or my banks follow fall into any of these two buckets one both the buckets are not very attractive today so just stay away and let the data play out it will play out and, and people will react to that data right so there will be see yeah, although everybody is betting on the flows there will be a group of active investors Oh, Vijay, you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Can you? Can you? Yes, yes, I can hear you. So, we need any further question, or shall we move on to next speaker? That's it from my side, my friends. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay ji. Thank you. Thanks. So, Sandeep, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Sandeep, you are on mute. uh so vijay any any view on the uh, it sector a whole, uh, active, it sector as whole um, maybe the large caps and the mid caps so okay so this is what it is right see it uh, again the way i look at it it's a sell on rally okay so so this is see this is how i classify so stocks or sectors so banking for me corporate banking for me is a buy on dip right and it is a sell on rally now between this rally and this dip i am on cash now why sell on rally is see this is a sector see this is a sector which has been in play for now or 30 years so infosys ipo happened in the mid early 90s now uh, early so it's almost 30 years now this is so over a period of time outsourcing has increased offshoring has also increased significantly but hello yeah so but hello yeah, please go ahead can you hear me yes yes yeah so what has happened is we were as offshoring has in increased uh, outsourcing has kind of come down because of the gccs right there have been significant amount of gccs which are coming up they are their own uh, challenges but what is happening is as the market has grown 
the market share of the Indian software services company has reduced. It's a fact, right? So, so essentially, over a period of time, as the world gets more comfortable with Indian software professionals and you know their own ability to manage us, so the opportunity for the services, the pure play services companies will drop. You think about it, you know, the largest uh, Indian IT vendor was once upon a time a division of a manufacturing company, right? So essentially, it's now the it's uh, it's now most most of the investments or most of the uh, large uh, con uh, large clients are actually starting to set up set up their own shops. So for me, when I'm looking at it, and I'm not very again the second thing is, see, I'm not very positive. See, look at China plus one, where I'm not very positive on the macro, but there is a gaining potential, you know, over a period of time where the plus one countries gain market share. Here is the reverse where the markets may not grow significantly, but the, in, the incumbent players will be losing market share. Now, in that situation, every rally is a Vijay, I think uh, you dropped a con. So every Every rally is an opportunity to reduce IT. Fair point, Vijay. So Vijay, like uh, you, although you somehow, I mean, somewhat mentioned about selling. So broadly, any any defined strategy when it comes to selling your positions. So uh, okay, so two three things, right? So essentially, see, uh, selling is very difficult, difficult to be honest, right? There is no one size uh, fits all, but so let's say I go into an investment with a certain thesis. The thesis has to uh, remain the same. The thesis changes, right? Or it plays out. Let's say for a moment I'm not, you know, not exiting at, uh, you know, when it's not played out. But let me assume it is playing out. At some point, you realize the marginal value that you are going to gain from that uh, thesis is not there. So, so, for example, right now when I look at corporate banks, I don't see upside from here. So, it's a very, it's a, see, buying is relatively easy, it's very well defined. Selling is not, because why selling is not is because at this point, if you really look at the earnings estimates of the things that you like, everybody is projecting like 20, 15, 20% growth on those, on those things or on those uh, set of companies or even at the market level. Now, when you look at it, Historically, when everybody is starting to project, so they, and also like, uh, so I don't give too much credence to you know analyst estimates and all that because I've seen it, uh, you know, two thousand seven, eight, then again in sixteen, you know, the entire entire uh, six seven year period between uh, 11, 12 to eighteen, nineteen, where we always started with a fifteen percent growth and ended with a three percent growth, right? So essentially, I don't uh, look at uh, too much of estimates that way. So if my thesis plays out, and and also that uh, if my if the narrative changes, the narratives don't change unfortunately, because narrative changes long after uh, the time to sell is gone. And again, to be to be clear, see, uh, it's like you know, uh, it's not that I'm I'm not negative on the negative on the idea of India or anything. So if I take that example of you know what happened in infrastructure. We created infrastructure in a brilliant way over the last 10 years, but stock returns were not there. Right. So if you look at some of the more uh, uh, popular themes today, we will create a huge defense infrastructure over the next 20 years. Now, the point here is what, to what extent is in the price. So when I look at that, so when there is too much of, uh, you know, narratives, too much of, uh, uh, too much of, uh, um, I mean, um, it's like, you know, you start getting into those dreamy valuations. It's, it's when, when I say time to trim some of those. All right, Vijay. So Vijay, like uh, what would be your advice to our audience in current market situation and any concluding remarks uh, afterward? See, so to me, it's like, so this year, 
there are two uh, two different things right two major things one is the india election which doesn't matter to markets at all right uh, which just doesn't matter and then there is this us election so this year us elections matter primarily because that's going to define the fii flow like i said the sub the, the the whole surprise element in markets today is when the fii will buy or sell because 15 20 sar crore sip aane wala hai right so that's not a surprise so what you need to keep watching out is what is happening outside of outside of india so this year again it's a it's a huge macro market china is super cheap so if i am if i am running a multi asset multi country portfolio i will be more inclined to put money to work in china than india this year so some of the fis may think that way which means some money may leave india get into you get into china which will uh, again uh, you need to be careful you need to be careful in terms of themes that you are running so we are going to create defense infrastructure we are going to create manufacturing base we, we will do everything but the point is that theme might have already played out in terms of market so yeah so so it's probably time to trim your uh, trim your portfolios I mean, it's not like you know. It's a. Uh, it's like you know. Look at what it is. Look at when you. You see, market is not going to think. You know, it is not going to see when you came in or when I came in, right? So it works on the collective, collective basis. So, so China is super attractive. Some of the FIs may shift. So just see what happens if they sell. great uh, thanks and uh, vijay thanks uh, first of all uh, for taking out time and sharing your insights and it's always uh, i mean as we say in uh, the equity markets there are n number of ways to uh, make money and your uh, framework is comparatively different to the normal league but uh, it is quite interesting and uh, i i totally uh, i mean there is a general perception when people say that uh, investing in the top 100 companies or top 50 companies you cannot generate alpha but uh, as you rightly said that uh, if the opportunities are right so you can uh, make big in those companies as well so thank you so much for taking out time and definitely as and when uh, situation demands would like to have uh, more interaction on your part and uh, definitely a value addition for everyone thank you so much thank you and and those who joined late uh, this session is recorded and i'll be uploading it over youtube uh, shortly so stay tuned and uh, you can listen to the conversation if you missed any portion of it. thank you so much everyone for joining good night take care